morning, everyone, and welcome to press conference four of EGU 23, which is the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. I'm Gillian D'Souza, EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I'll be your host of today's press conference, as well as I will be facilitating all of the media interactions that will be happening during this week. I will shortly introduce our speakers for today, but before that, I wanted to add that each of the press conferences will be recorded live and streamed for journalists who are also joining us virtually. Um, and the press conference will have time for speakers to make their presentations one after the other, followed by a combined question and answer period at the end of the briefing. So um, if you're joining us virtually, I ask that you mute your mics through the press briefing and we will then have you unmuted during the Q&A round at the end. I'm now going to go ahead and introduce our esteemed speakers for today. So our press conference is titled, Early Warning for Extreme Events, Earthquakes, Droughts, Floods, and Livestock Disease. Our participants for today are, starting from my um, right, Martha Hahn from the Swiss Seismological Service, ETH Zurich, then we are joined by Pedro Lima Alensar from the Technical University Berlin Institute for Oncology, um, Germany. And um, our virtual speaker, who's number three, is Frederick Huthoff from HKV and University of Twente, Netherlands. And finally, we have Paola Nassisi from the Centro Euro Mediterraneano, um, Sue. I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing um, all of these words. Um, uh, Cambiamenti Climatici Lessi, Italy. The Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. There you yeah. go. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> that was so much easier. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Uh, so we are ready to begin and we will follow the order that I just announced our speakers in. Um, we already have your slides queued in. You have the clicker if you would like to begin your presentation. We will first hear from Martha. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, do I need yeah. to do anything or? Yeah, okay. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, I don't know about you, but yesterday when I was going back home from here, I got totally wet. So in the morning uh, today, I made sure to check Vienna weather forecast. Now, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do the same for earthquakes? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I will not now look into my crystal ball and tell you the next magnitude of that and that will happen then and there. Uh, this is currently not possible. Uh, however, I think there is still some things that we can explain and that are worth looking into. Uh, for example, as we are here in Vienna, you're probably not so worried that a big earthquake will strike us now, but if we were in Chile or Japan, uh, it would be a different situation, I guess. Uh, so on a European scale, this is exactly what we have. Uh, this uh, spatial variation is in seism seismicity rates explained by the European seismic hazard model uh, that gathered a lot of historical and physical data uh, in this um, visualization. Uh, we see the space varying, uh, like let's say, probability or likelihood that uh, an earthquake will occur in different places. Uh, however, uh, if a big earthquake did happen now, uh, first aid responders would probably be interested in knowing uh, is it safe to enter this building and rescue us, uh, and so on. Uh, so there is a time dependent component to this, and uh, I think it is worth modeling and looking into. And this is not something that I invented. It's been happening in the US and New Zealand. Uh, here we see for Italy and uh, in Switzerland uh, within the Swiss Seismological Service, a model has been developed and tested uh, that issues these time, time dependent forecasts uh, for Switzerland. Uh, so in these images, we see that after magnitude 4.7, uh, near Basel, uh, the probability of another earthquake above magnitude 2.5 occurring in that uh, area during the next day is much higher uh, than normally. Uh, so I just want to state 
uh, very clearly that uh, the European model is not meant to overrule any forecasts issued by the national and regional agencies. They are still in charge of their respective areas. It is just meant to provide something harmonized uh, baseline, uh, such as the ha hazard model that we saw before uh, does in a time independent uh, manner. Uh, so in order to make this model, we need uh, data on the past earthquakes. Uh, this data is gathered by many different agencies in many different areas in different ways. Uh, and we have methods to account for this when making our model, but uh, we need to know what these differences are. So what is the precision that uh, we record earthquakes to? Uh, how low magnitudes uh, are we able to detect? Uh, and so on. Uh, uh, fortunately, this data has been gathered within the hazard uh, model development, uh, so we are using their catalog uh, and the expert solicitations for these data properties uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, and having this data, uh, we establish a model, so we use uh, epidemic, so-called epidemic type aftershock sequence models. This is also not something that uh, I invented. It's been around for a long time. Uh, and the main strength of these models is in explaining the aftershock uh, behavior. So we know that after a big event uh, has happened, it triggers another event. Those events trigger their own aftershocks and so on. Uh, these aftershocks, we know that they uh, decrease in time and space as we move further from the main event, and but they increase in number as the magnitude of the main event increases. So a magnitude six will have far more aftershocks than a magnitude three. Uh, and these uh, models, ETAS models, uh, are agreed upon by the experts worldwide uh, to be suitable for issuing these forecasts. Uh, there has been an initiative uh, by SED, that's Swiss Seismological Service, uh, to gather uh, the experts' opinions and experiences in good practices uh, in op operational earthquake forecasting. There is a survey result uh, shown here uh, that basically says, says that there is a, an agreement within the expert community that these models, models are okay for uh, issuing the forecasts. So here you don't have to worry about much. It's just to say that we model these dots, that is our data, with these lines, uh, and they explain that the uh, number of aftershocks decays in time and space uh, as we move, move further from the main event and increase in product productivity. But here in this third plot, you can see that the line is a bit below the dots, which means that uh, our model, which is represented by the line, uh, tends to under uh, forecast the number of aftershocks of the large magnitude events. Uh, this is something that we uh, are addressing that has been observed in literature also before. Uh, also, one important modification that we want to uh, make to our model is to make the background uh, seismicity consistent with the hazard model that I showed in the first slide. Uh, and our product that we want to have is the operational forecasting, which means that it's uh, regularly updated and available online. Uh, so one example of how we could, we could visualize this is shown here. Uh, the plot on the left uh, displays uh, the expected number of events or earthquakes um, per time and uh, space uh, unit. Um, we see that it's uh, spatially variant and it changes from the left to right. Uh, what happened in the meantime is uh, magnitude six in Greece. And there is a mistake on this slide. This was in 2015, not so recent. Uh, so here maybe you cannot see that much because of course this event doesn't happen doesn't uh, affect anything affect anything in Iceland but if we zoom in to this area uh, we see that the expected number of events above magnitude 3.5 has increased significantly in uh, the area uh, around the main event uh, during the day following that event uh, so in order to make these forecasts as accurate as possible. We are working on uh, some modifications, as I said, and improvements to the model. Uh, we also observed the 
uh, the sequence that happened uh, unfortunately recently in February in Turkey and Syria. Uh, that sequence has uh, inspired, let's say, the um, further work on sequence specific updating of our model. There is a poster on that that will be displayed on Thursday if you are interested. Uh, so that's it. Here are the links to the abstract of this talk that's also happening tomorrow and the poster on Thursday and my email if you want to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. And now we will hear from Pedro when your slides are ready to go. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. That's kind of my first press conference, so I'm a little bit ner nervous, so please forgive me uh, if any mistakes. So this, I would like to present to you today some of our latest uh, uh, research together with Professor Eva Payton in the Ecohydrology and Landscape Assessment Department of Technical University Berlin. And what we're interested in is in developing a framework that can define better extreme events, and we are looking specifically to droughts. Uh, so we are talking here about forecasting, but to forecast some event, we first need to know uh, what is that we are forecasting, what is actually defined as a drought or any other kind of extreme events like flash droughts. It's one of the things that I'll be talking today. So we are kind of keeping a step back and looking into the landscape of research and definitions of flash droughts and, and seeing what it's uh, actually a, a drought. Uh, so what we're proposing is a new framework uh, and the idea is that its new framework is a way to improve our communication to the society. Uh, it easily uh, takes into account seasonality because when droughts happen also matters, not only if they happen and how intense. Uh, we are also interested in seeing what kinds of threats are related to each type of drought or extreme event. And also to be able to adapt these uh, definitions and frameworks to new and emerging uh, extreme events caused by climate change. Uh, so uh, initially, uh, what we observed is that the usual way to identify and to define extreme events, such as droughts, is very data-centered. So usually researchers, they, they observe an event, and from that, it is built into a model and then derived impacts and maybe communication to society. There's a maybe. And this is very meaningful and relevant information because if we don't do that, we have nothing. But there is maybe a better way to do. We observed that initially uh, when looking into flash droughts, which is a new topic in the drought uh, community, where if you look at this graph here, we have each uh, row showing a different method to identify the same type of event, flash drought. And what we conclude from this graph is that they don't agree quite often. They agree sometimes, but sometimes they just fail. And so it begs the question, which one is correct? Or any of them are correct, or all of them? So, uh, what we propose then to try to conciliate uh, this data with events and impacts as an inverted pyramid of priorities where we first communicate and dialogue with community, with society, to understand what are the impacts of extreme events for their different users. Uh, and then we use this knowledge to build our models, assess impacts and uh, thresholds, sorry, and then um, assess what are actual events and then communicate back to the society, okay, so, for those impacts, for the perception of impacts, those are the kinds of events that should cause trouble or hazard. So into a little bit of an example of how it looks like, uh, I'm gonna talk about flash drought, which is different, in, different from the conventional droughts that are large areas and long periods of time. This is a short lived drought that's mainly occurring in the top soil. Uh, so you have a rapid depletion of soil moisture. So we using data from Brandenburg, Potsdam uh, in Northeast Germany, and also the crop uh, of barley, which is one of the main uh, produce in the region. Uh, we built also a dashboard that you can go there and assess uh, how is the historical production of grains in the region. Uh, and we want to then identify or define flash drought considering this region, Brandenburg, and this use, barley. 
Um, with this, uh, what we can have is, um, let's say, a producer in Brandenburg uh, expects to produce around 5.3 tons per hectare of barley in, a in any year. That's kind of the goal, uh, the general uh, average historically. Uh, and maybe you have one producer that is very cautious and sees that if he produces, if they produce less than 10%, or I mean, they have a loss of 10% or produce only 90% of the expected, this is already an impact. Uh, but maybe you have another one who maybe has a better insurance or is just more prone to go into risky <laughs> situations and see that uh, an impact for them is a 50% loss. So uh, these results, uh, I, I can point, well, um, but this will then uh, derive different events. So a flash drought for the risk prone producer and to the risk avoidance uh, producer are different. And they also are different from the off the shelf methods that we have today when we are trying to identify flash droughts. And I try to represent that in that graph. So in the top row, you have less events uh, that are perceived only by, that are perceived by the high damage acceptance, high risk acceptance. And if for the low risk acceptance, uh, you have much more events than the high risk and also than the off the shelf, which is kind of intermediary. And what is important, just to close my talk, is that these off-the-shelf methods, they often, as I said, are very data-centered, so they don't take into account what is the land use, what are the local conditions of the soil, vegetation, and, and also often they are values that are just kind of um, estimated by specialists, but they are not necessarily um, uh, derived from, from any urgencies. So... That's what I wanted to point out. Uh, going then in summary, um, we have we are proposing a new method that improves communication and improves our understanding of what are droughts based on impacts and the society uh, demands. Uh, here's also a way to contact me and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pedro. We will now hear from our virtual speaker. So Frederick, whenever you are ready. Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, first of all, I'm going to try to share my screen. I believe that now worked. Is that correct? Um, we are still waiting on looking at your screen. Not yet. Oh, one more button click, I believe. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks. Um, well, he hello, my name is uh, Frederick Huthoff. Um, I'm a researcher and consultant in the area of uh, water management and disaster risk reduction. Um, on behalf of my colleagues at HKV and the University of Twente in the Netherlands, I'm going to present some results on a global approach for hazard forecasting, um, yeah, of something that we've been working. So first, uh, some background on early warning systems. Um, it's been all over the news uh, at the recent uh, COP27 in Egypt. Uh, it was emphasized that a cost-effective way to reduce the impact of natural disasters, uh, specifically floods, uh, is to invest in early warning systems. And um, well, these can then warn vulnerable populations in time and emergency measures can be carried out to reduce harmful impacts. Now in the action plan, early warning for all, uh, 3.1 billion US dollars has been pledged uh, with about one third uh, assigned to uh, observation and forecasting to achieve global early warning services by 2027. Now, this is only a few years away, uh, but surely not impossible if you realize that technologies for such systems are readily available and are being used at many places uh, around the world already. Now, the big challenge is to make these work everywhere. And this is really where it becomes difficult. So in many of the most vulnerable countries, various attempts have already been made to introduce highly advanced technologies, but still early warning systems have not become 
part of standard operational procedures and also many times have not really left a lasting impact. Now, many times the problem is that such systems are not well aligned with existing operational procedures, technical or local technical uh, capacities, available data, et cetera. So what we think uh, that is needed is, or yeah, what we think that is needed to make a real jump forward um, is to establish a basic approach that works well everywhere. Um, and not only that, but also that functions on globally available data that is not difficult to understand uh, or to operate and from which you can uh, grow and expand. Now, here's an outline of our proposed approach. Um, uh, we establish static hazard maps based on terrain characteristics. Uh, that's, that's on the left here. Um, and well, where possible, we supplement these with experience from recent uh, local extreme events. So on the left, you see a landslide susceptibility map that we constructed based on terrain slope, land cover, soil type, and elevation. And we constructed a similar static map for potential flooded areas uh, based on elevation and drainage network. And that map is not shown here. Then next, in the middle figure, you see real-time or forecasted uh, precipitation values and rainfall uh, from global meteorological models. And this rainfall is, of course, the driver of the hazard, uh, in this case for landslides, but it works similarly for floods. And this information is actually available globally uh, for the next 10 days, uh, the global forecasting system, uh, forecasting system. It's not ours, but it's available. And then on the right, we combine the static hazard map from the left with the, let's say, real-time or forecasted expected rainfall from the middle and emphasize those areas where landslides or floods may occur because of the actual rainfall conditions. Now, and then places where potential hazards and rainfall quantities are high here, a certain combined threshold can be exceeded and that leads then to emergency alert. So there's your, your early warning. Now, this type of calculation is actually very simple and can be done quickly on a global level. Um, essentially, what we do is we immediately translate rainfall to different hazards. And wherever a threshold is exceeded, you can then issue alerts or warnings. And to just stress again, um, the information for this is available everywhere globally and can do forecasts for the next 10 days. And I already mentioned that this can be done for landslides and floods, but similarly, also droughts and forest fires uh, could be addressed. Um, now, of course, there's some need for a disclaimer. Uh, detailed processes such as overland routing and smaller flow obstructions in the terrain are not taken into account. But to get a first indication of oncoming dangers uh, under very extreme conditions, um, this is surely better than what many of the most vulnerable countries have available right now. Now then, another key characteristic that I want to point out, which works very well in this approach, is that there are no artifacts uh, in the hazard estimates from artificial boundaries. Uh, uh, first of all, by using global data sets, political boundaries do not play any role in the hazard estimates, uh, as they shouldn't. And next, um, for the case of flood forecasting, it is very common that advanced flow routing models take on boundaries of river basins. Now, this makes perfect sense for minor flood events, but there are many examples known where under extreme flood conditions, water from neighboring river basins uh, become interconnected. Now, an example is shown here for the Likungu River in Mozambique. Uh, where in 2015, floodwaters um, extended all along the coast, even towards the Zambezi River Basin. Uh, in, and in black here, you see the uh, Likungu River Basin boundaries. And here on the left, you see the actual satellite detected floodwaters that occurred in 2015. And on the right here, um, you see our flood hazard prediction from global data. Now, it shows that these agree very well. And well, the predicted flood extent would not have been possible with more advanced hydraulic flow models that are limited to these uh, basin boundaries. Okay, then 
Next, I want to briefly show that our proposed approach can indeed also inform and help with early action. Uh, here's an example for the Manambolo watershed in Madagascar, where you can see that if you zoom in on the derived flood hazard map for individual communities, uh, there is a quite distinct indication of vulnerabilities. Uh, in this image on the right, in the blue areas, you can see that certain parts of the community are actually affected by flood hazard much more than others, and also that certain access roads uh, are among the first crucial infrastructures to be affected. Now, early action, of course, has to take uh, those aspects into account and focus on precisely those areas. Okay, then finally to summarize, um, so we propose a global early warning approach for various types of hazards based on readily available global data sets. Um, we applied this to several test cases in Africa and Central America showing good results. Uh, the approach can easily be expanded to a global scale because all the data is available, even allowing forecasts for the next 10 days. Next, based on the spatial extents of the hazards, it's even possible to estimate affected populations or uh, infrastructures or other assets um, present. Um, of course, it still requires quite some work to get this done on a global scale, uh, especially to define suitable alert levels for different places around the world. But we can confidently say that this is possible for a fraction of the pledged budget um, from COP27. So my final message, um, yeah, let's focus on developing such systems that work everywhere and then gradually improve from there when better local information is available and local capacity can carry it. Um, many attempts for early warning have failed in the past, and now let's get it right and make sure that early warning for all uh, is indeed achieved uh, within the next four years. So. Let's use what's available, what works already, uh, that is robust uh, and simple to set up and build upon. Thank you. Uh, and final comment I want to make. So obviously I'm not in Vienna at the moment, but I will be there in person uh, on Friday also. Thanks. Thank you, Frederick. And now we will move on to our last speaker, Paula, we are just loading her slides in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I will introduce you. Uh, the main uh, objectives uh, of an early warning decision support system for uh, disease outbreaks in the livestock sector. The livestock sector contributes uh, substantially to the European economy with about 168 billion annually and 45% of the total agricultural activity. It involves a wide diversity of production system uh, with 4 million of employees and uh, 400 billion of European industries linked to the animal uh, uh, production. However, climate change uh, with its variability and uh, extreme events uh, affects the livestock sector in many aspects. Uh, ranging from uh, animal well, animal well-being, um, production of uh, milk and meat, reproduction, but also diseases and their spread, and uh, food quality and availability. For example, um, very uh, long period of uh, um, high temperature uh, combined with excess of humidity. Um, may uh, affect uh, neg ne in, may negatively affect uh, the animals uh, because the perceived temperature uh, would be very very high. But also cold extremes uh, or extraordinarily windy conditions uh, could neg negatively affect uh, 
uh, food and uh, the animal well-being, of course. In this context, uh, the uh, European-funded project uh, Sebastian aims uh, to provide support for a more effective uh, and sustainable management of the livestock sector in Italy, and in particular for uh, uh, cattle, sheep, and, uh, and goat breeding. Um, this is uh, some numbers uh, related to our project. Uh, we have a number of farms uh, monitored uh, in different ways uh, uh, and allow us to have a vast amount of data related to different, um, different species of cattle, sheep, and uh, goat, um, with about uh, more than uh, 3 million of monitored animals uh, that al allow us to, uh, to uh, to do uh, analysis, important analysis of uh, this data with uh, a lot of samples uh, gathered. Uh, so the aim of the other project is to put together uh, weather and climate data sets uh, with territorial aspects, for example, uh, the presence of uh, vegetation around the farms, um, the um, slope of the soil, um, but also animal welfare indicators and uh, sensor-based data coming from uh, uh, IoT devices, devices sorry, installed on the animals to detect uh, environmental temperature and humidity around the animals, the position, of course, of it, and uh, uh, the movement, but also the skin uh, temperature. And these data um, are collected and summarized through advanced techniques using uh, statistical uh, indicators or machine learning algorithms um, to provide user-tailored information for the stakeholders, for breeders, but also for researchers, uh, policy makers, but also companies interested in, the, in this sector. And uh, uh, the main goal is, uh, of course, to promptly notify uh, breeders uh, when um, hazardous conditions occur. Now, just uh, um, a brief video that uh, nicely, nicely uh, summarized the, the main uh, objective uh, of the project. Production and products of animal origin make up 45% of the EU agricultural annual value. In Italy, the livestock sector accounts for 36% of the total agricultural production. The change is having a negative impact on livestock management. Changes are more valuable than extreme. And it is important to anticipate and mitigate the effects by employing suitable farming practices and by adapting to the ever-changing environmental conditions. In this context, the main goal of the Sebastian project is to deliver a support system for long and short-term decision making. Sebastian is a tool and service web platform gathering a huge amount of data about Italy that is integrated, harmonized, and summed up with sensitive statistical indicators and machine learning algorithms. The aim of Sebastian is to transform access and to reuse existing data indicators and tools as well as creating new ones. Geospatial, meteorological, earth observational, and environment data and statistics, new and reused, are the bread and butter of Sebastian platform. Sensors can monitor animal well-being in real time. Historical climate simulations and future projections over Italy are exploited at a very high geographical resolution. Satellite data detect and combine different features of the vegetation structure, phases, and new chosen points of context. 
and both she and great scholars, researchers, educators, and teachers, policy makers, ICT companies, and many more are involved in the creation and testing of the Sebastian platform services. Sebastian Web Portal is a single point of access to data, services, and informative content for you. Supporting livestock farming and free adaptation for environmental conditions and production needs. Alerting about approaching or projected dangerous environmental circumstances. Feed availability for outdoor pastures. Providing updated risk maps of parasite and disease flow. Sebastian does mark livestock farming and management in a challenging environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paula, for that very insightful presentation. And now we will move to the next part of our press conference, which is the question and answer round. So I open the floor to questions from journalists, both in the room and those who have joined us online. If you have a question and you're in the room, I will hand over the mic to you. Uh, please introduce yourself and let us know what your question is. If you are in the room, you have, if you are joining us virtually, you have two options. You can either type in your question in the chat or you can use the hand raising function on Zoom and we will come to you for your question. So over to you now. Do we have any questions coming in? Okay, we have one already. Hi, I'm uh, Nicolas. I'm a journalism student in the University of Paris, and thank you for all your presentations. So I have a really like, general question for all of you. Um, would you think there is more and more cooperation between people working on different uh, hazards, such as droughts or floods, et cetera, since some of them are quite really related, like uh, droughts can really like to heavier rains, for example, in the Mediterranean. So I was wondering whether um, people from different hazards may come to cooperate a little bit more since the models are getting more and more complex or is it so much specialized that you don't even have the time to cooperate or to create like common models with other researchers that question makes sense of course <laughs> i can answer um uh, i think that uh, um yes it's it is quite difficult to but um, um, we have to uh, because um, these topics are uh, strictly related to each other. I was thinking to like the livestock sector, for example, it is uh, that depends on droughts presented by Pedro before. And I think that uh, uh, the European Commission is investing um, to create uh, uh, more cooperation between these uh, topics and uh, also between the infrastructures that uh, provide support to these uh, sectors. So yes, uh, I think that uh, we are going uh, toward uh, um, a more integrated solutions uh, to support uh, uh, this diversity. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can just, add on uh, my colleagues and so uh, there is indeed a pressing uh, necessity to, to more cooperation, uh, especially in the, there is also a new, not so new, but the compound event uh, realm of extreme weather when you have either simultaneous or followed uh, like sequential events. And this urges the cooperation, for instance, I work more with droughts and maybe you have forest fires developed and after forest fires, you might have storms that will lead to higher uh, land degradation. And then you have three different disciplines that have to cooperate together. So yeah, I think that's what we are all walking towards, but yes, it's challenging with the current uh, requisites of funding yeah, and all yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, one more. Hi, um, so my name is Katrin and I'm with the uh, EG Press Office. Um, I'm not sure if this would be a question for Pedro or for um, someone else, but I was very interested in uh, the section of your presentation that talked about how 
um, inaccurate impact assessments can affect uh, the accuracy of drop modeling. And I was wondering if this could also apply to other kinds of hazards like flooding, flood modeling. Okay. Well, um, hmm, that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, what happened, I was actually just having this conversation this morning, it was a convenience session uh, earlier, and a colleague from the US was talking about how farmers in a specific pixel from the US drought monitor have problems because uh, that pixel is kind of unique and it's not well represented by all the other trial definitions. So they often have hindered uh, expectations uh, and get frustrated because the drought monitor doesn't flag their region as experiencing droughts, but then they go to their fields and see the vegetation suffering. At, and that's why we need uh, to look, like that's actually at least my point of view that we should first look at the impacts uh, and I mean, that's not uniquely my view. It's something that the community has been paying more and more attention. And I think that's uh, in the floods, um, this is very uh, more advanced, I would say, and well played uh, than in droughts. Uh, actually, some of the techniques that I've been trying to implement, I, I inspire from, from flood uh, analysis. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Kitchen. Okay, great. Do we have any more questions? Doesn't seem like we have questions from any of our virtual attendees. Okay, so if we have no more questions, then we are ready to conclude our press briefing for today. Thank you once again to our speakers and um, even to Frederick. Thank you for joining us virtually and like he mentioned, he's going to be in Vienna as well. So if we have any questions for him, interviews for our virtual attendees as well as in person, please reach out to me and we'll be happy to facilitate. Uh, this entire press conference is going to be recorded and will be uploaded um, to our YouTube channel later today. Thank you once again. And um, I encourage you to check out our press packs, uh, the printed and digital to know what our next press conferences are. We are done for the press briefings of today, but we have some exciting ones lined up till Thursday. So two tomorrow and two on Thursday. Thank you very much and have a good day.